The evolution of digital technology won't stop here. Every generation of humankind likes to think that it is the creme de la creme of uh, history, but it, it's usually not. So more things will happen in the future. And I wanted to give you some glimpses in what ICT uh, might look like in the future, where we are going. But let's start with a caveat. It is very difficult to see what the future holds, especially if you deal with a logic of exponential technological progress. Uh, I want to give you some predictions that have been made in the past. For example, somebody predicted that Everything that can be invented has been invented. That was the commissioner of the US Patent Office in 1899. And he closed the office down, so convinced he was of, of, of that fact. <laughs> Another one here said that television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at a Playwood box every night. That was an executive of 20th Century Fox in 1946. Good for him that, and for his company that that didn't become a reality. Here another one. I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. That is attributed to the legendary Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM. The supercomputer Watson is named after him. Also good for his company that there was a world market of more than five computers. <laughs> Let's have another one you like these. Um, for example here, there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. That was the founder of digital equipments in 1977. Sure, why would anyone want a computer in their home? And here, nuclear power vacuum cleaners will probably be a reality within 10 years from a vacuum cleaning company in 1955. Thank God that didn't happen. Um, and here another one. Two years from now, spam will be solved. That was Bill Gates in 2004. Well, is it solved? Is it not solved? Well, sometimes predictions are better than others, and at the, at the end, you just have to remember Clark's third law, which says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So with that caveat in mind, let's have a look where ICT might be going. Let's start with the future of the World Wide Web. You, people usually classify the evolution of the web into different periods. They talk about the web 1.0, the web 2.0, uh, and the web 3.0, which you might have heard. So, so what does that stand for? The web 1.0, the original World Wide Web, was basically a web of organizations. So academic institutions had a web page, maybe some journalistic outlets, and some companies had a web page, and some governments had a web page, but uh, most web pages were basically provided by organizations. Now the revolution of the web 2.0 was the revolution of the people. Now suddenly individuals had web pages. It means before as well some musicians, artists, academics, they had some web pages, but with social media, for example with Facebook and so forth, every individual could suddenly now have a web page. With YouTube, every individual could even have basically equivalent of a TV station, their own channels, uploading their own content. So uh, this means that now we had a page per individual. First a page per organization, then a page per individual. And the Web 3.0, what does that stand for? People usually associate it with the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, the semantic web that basically means that now everything has a web page. Well, maybe not a web page, but at least uh, an internet protocol number, an IP number. That means that cars will have an IP number. Even the parts of the cars will have an IP number. Everything in the production chain will have an IP address. Every fruit, every vegetable that is produced in agriculture will be assigned an IP address. It, it is the internet of everything, the internet of things. So we have organization, people, and things. Why would we want to connect everything? Well, it's because then once they're connected to the internet, we can communicate with them. They can communicate among 
themselves. They can tell themselves, for example, listen, I'm going out of service in six months. They have some intelligence and can communicate it to some other machine, which then can help it. So, so things can communicate among each other uh, in the industry as well. That's very important. Parts will communicate with each other in a sense that then robotics can help with artificial intelligence to coordinate some processes. Now, in order for things to coordinate among each other, they have to understand meaning. And that's why the web 3.0 often goes together with the catchphrase semantic web, semantic states for meaning. That means the challenge here consists in allowing machines to understand meaning. So for example, meaning means that we provide the semantic network of what does one term actually mean. We provide that to the machines. For example, here you can see the definition of the semantic meaning of the word giraffe. It eats leaves, it has hooves, it's preyed by a lion, it is a mammal, which is an animal, and these how semantic nets are constructed. So the semantic web means that we have to teach these kind of meaning networks to our technology. And there are several efforts underway in how to do that. One is, for example, called the web ontology language. People also call it the one word language because people say that will lead to the fact that now there is one standardized meaning for something. For example, if you now say the word bank, you don't really know, am I referring to a river bank or am I referring to a financial institution? So basically what you have to do in order to uh, convey this context is you have to provide this context. Usually you understand it out of a conversation. And what we do with the machines, that means we have to introduce an additional layer. We do that behind the scenes. You won't really see that. But then a word like bank will have an additional layer which defines what do you mean by bank in this context? Do you mean a financial institution or do you mean a river bank? And the second layer then, and that's what these languages are about, uh, helps the machines to understand meaning. Now, once a machine understands meaning, you can give it instructions. You can just say, call my dentist and make an appointment. Well, what do you mean by dentist? Well, you have to explain. My dentist means this kind. And so we have to teach meaning to the machines. And that is a crucial part of this next stage in the development of the web, which they call the web 3.0, which has to do with the semantic web. Another tendency of the evolutionary trajectory of digital technology that becomes very clear are, of course, wearable. That has to do with your smartwatches, with your Fitbits, and with some very concrete ways of how we can use this technology to enhance our bodily functions. For example, there's already technology that you can use to listen to a conversation, which is many, many feet away. Even so, if you're in a noisy cocktail party, you just use that, zoom in and listen to somebody who's 100 feet away. Or some artists or also surgeons start to use digital technology in order to enhance the motoric of their hands. So you can use digital technology to guide you very finely in order to draw or in order to do a heart surgery. So we are starting to merge with our technology and we always find ways how we can merge with it closer and closer. Here, for example, is a tendency which has to do with merging our thoughts with digital interfaces. For example, in this application, the defense ministry is very interested that fighter pilots can maneuver an airplane just with their thoughts. So when they think about turn the airplane right, the airplane will go right. You can cut out a couple of microseconds that it usually takes from your thought to your hand reaction. And by simply thinking about turn right, the airplane already can turn right. The same technology is used for um, disabled people who are quadriplegic. That means they're basically locked into their body. All they can move is their eyes and they cannot move anything else, but they can think. So we use these kind of 
brain computer interfaces, brain machine interfaces, to let them communicate directly with the computer, which allows them then, for example, to manage a robotic arm. There are two ways you can do that. One is invasive, that you see in this picture down here. That means you actually make a hole in your skull and you connect sensors to your brain tissue. And the other one is non-invasive, with this kind of bathing cap with lots of sensors that you just put on. And these, these sensors pick up your neural activity. And it doesn't have to be really a one-to-one -one match of your thoughts and the reaction. For example, you can just say, think about a football. And then you record the neural activity of a football. And with that, then you tell the machine to print the letter F. And then you say something also very strong, like think about love. And you record the neural activity that happens when you think about love. And then you tell the machine, now print the letter L. And with this, you can type just by thinking. Now, recently, some researchers have that turned the other way around. For example, here uh, in this uh, exercise, what two researchers did is one watched at a video game, a pirate video game, so where pirate ships would come by and you would shoot them. The problem was this person didn't have a joystick to shoot them. He just had a brain computer interface on his head and he was thinking, now shoot. His colleague on the other side of campus didn't see the screen, but he had a joystick and he was also connected to this brain computer interface and he just received a stimulus that told his brain, now react and shoot. And he, he didn't know when, but he got this impulse and then he just pressed the button and he hit a very large number of these pirate ships. So basically it was a division of work between one person who saw something and thought about it. This thought was transmitted over the internet and another person who didn't have the eyes but had the hand then carried out the action. <laughs> Pretty crazy world we're going into. So these brain machine, brain computer interfaces basically start to merge man and machine connect our thoughts to the internet. Talking about the future evolution of digital technology, there's one thing I still have to explain to you before I can let you go for today. And that has to do with the question of where will it all end up? Uh, I, I was very explicit in saying technological progress is becoming faster and faster. There's exponential growth. And if we map, for example, all the events of the history of events in the universe, they're becoming faster and faster and faster. And the question is like, what will happen down here? Where will it end up? What will happen down here is what many people call the singularity, the technological singularity. Uh, and that has to do with the hypothesis that accelerating progress in technologies will cause runaway effects, wherein artificial intelligence will exceed human in intellectual capacity and control the radically changing civilization in this event called singularity. That means that mach machine intelligence basically overtakes human intellect at one point. Now, uh, that's pretty scary, especially if you think about future visions like the Terminator, Skynet awakening, and, or, or the Matrix, turning us into batteries or whatever. Now, if you think about it more in the sense of Kasparov, it basically means that this transhuman implies a merger between man and machine. And in that sense, I think is the best way to think about it. So basically singularity means that we will merge with our machines and it applies a new stage of evolution for humankind. An evolution that is not only characterized by biological evolution, but by a co-evolution between technological evolution, and that's what you talked about today, and biological evolution. Now, the idea of technological singularity is pretty tough to swallow for our 
human egos. I completely know. And most people have problems with it and also reject it. Not in the technology sector, so. If you go and talk with the leaders of Silicon Valley, there is none of them that seriously rejects the singularity hypothesis. But in the general public, what happens, what many people say, is the phenomena that is similar to a frog who's sitting in hot water, the hot water being the rise of artificial intelligence and not noticing actually what's happening. And many people say not that the singularity is about to come, the singularity is already here. Check out this video if you don't know what I'm talking about with regard to the frog and the hot water. Please be assured that no frog got hurt in this video. It was just a plastic frog. Uh, but I wanted to show you this very visual explanation to show you how serious this issue actually is. So digital intelligence is rising. And many people say not that the singularity is closed. The singularity is already here. We don't have to wait until we connect our brains through brain-computer interfaces to the internet. Just try the following. Turn off your mobile phone just for a month or two and you see how dependent you already are to, with this technology, to this technology and how we already co-evolve, how we outsource some part of our intelligence to these machines, rely on them and how we drive them forward. So the idea is not to reject it, but to understand that the temperature of the water is rising that the singularity is here, and that our generation takes up the responsibility to shape this future co-evolution between humans and technology. The co-evolution between the evolution, future evolution of humankind and technological evolution. And as I said today several times, they work very similarly, and in the future they will merge into one transhuman evolutionary trajectory.